in Colorado, there is watch out weather and there is watch this weather. We'll give you a heads up if something nasty is coming your way, but here on next, we will not be hyping watch this into watch out. Meteorologist Danielle Grant says we are in watch this mode weather wise this afternoon, able to sit back and check out the wild photos coming to us from out of the Colorado Springs area. Nothing dangerous here in the metro area. Colorado will not be voting on anti fracking ballot measures this year. We learned today that they did not have enough valid signatures to get on the ballot. Drill deeper though in the petitions, not the earth, and you will find layer after layer of similar looking signatures. The same strata of suspiciousness seen during Republican primaries, the same stuff that led to criminal forgery charges against a petition signature gatherer. As we dig into this new round, we find a fracking dumpster fire of a democratic process and a suggestion from the Secretary of State on one way to fix it. Here's Steve Sager. This is not a throwaway page. It's a sworn statement that these people actually appeared in front of them. A sworn statement that when you collected signatures, you collected valid ones. So this signature gatherer named Saeed said that he did. Yet you got to admit, the handwriting on some is pretty similar. And look at these signatures, shockingly similar as well. Yet they're all different people. If we see a page where it looks like everyone has it exactly matching signature, then we referred over to the attorney general's office. We talked to Saeed on the phone today. He told us the issue came about when he was working with homeless people. Let me quote him for a second. Some of the homeless men didn't have any addresses, so their friends would be like, yeah, I used to live in this address. They just write some bull See, that still doesn't make it okay. We're depending on that circulator's oath for the entire integrity of the process. That's not uh, my signature, but that's my name. If this sounds familiar, that's because it is. Uh, it a was gatherer was already arrested and charged right. with forging signatures on nominating petitions for former yeah, Senate candidate John Kaiser and state Senate candidate Jim Smallwood earlier this year. The Secretary of State doesn't individually verify every signature on a petition, but Wayne Williams says a new kind of software may make it possible they just need money. And we'll probably be taking that to the legislature and say, we could add this process. It would ensure that things were more valid. It would take some time. It would take some money. For next, I'm Steve Steger. The attorney general's office is going to look into this, and there are more examples than the ones that Steve showed you. I'm no signature expert, but there's a chance when they talk to Saeed, they may want to ask about the signature thing. See, he's got this distinctive little wing on it, and what are the odds? It's, it's the same as the, the people that he met out there. Jasmine, wing, Jack, wing, Harris, wing. Interesting. Anyway, we'll follow up. The FAA's new drone rules in effect today deal with where drones fly, but they don't address the privacy concerns from next viewers that we've been addressing here. Commercial drones have to weigh less than 55 pounds. They now cannot fly higher than 400 feet, and they can't fly more than 100 miles per hour. They can only be operated during daylight hours. Commercial drone operators also have to qualify for flying licenses, and those operators must be 16 years old or older. We have a link to the drone testing centers in the metro area on our Facebook page. The FAA offers voluntary best practice guidelines when it comes to privacy, the issue you've raised. The FAA will not go after a drone operator if there is a drone hovering over your backyard, and Denver police tell us they won't get involved either. The jewelry heist being investigated out at the airport is not Ocean's Eleven stuff, but it does appear to be an inside job involving diamonds in a bag. A United Airlines employee named Rafael Magana is accused of felony theft. He was supposed to be holding on to a jewelry case left behind by a passenger from Aspen. He held on to it all right. According to the search warrant that our Nine Wants to Know team found, investigators say Magana got caught on airport cameras taking diamond earrings, bracelets, and other shiny expensive things worth $129,000 and dumping them in a paper stack and then skedaddling. Police say when Magana was confronted, he confessed. Voting? is sexy and Colorado is one hot state hotter than the other ones. It came out today that Colorado has the highest percentage of registered voters in America, according to the state's elections director. 86% registered in the 2014 elections. Of course, we're a battleground state and there are a lot of groups out there actively trying to register voters. The progressive group New Era Colorado focuses on registering young people. Colorado has made voter registration a whole lot more accessible for people. But for young voters, they're our election's newest voters, uh, and they need to be introduced to this process. And so being a friendly peer-to-peer -peer face out there in the field, meeting them where they're, where they're at to introduce them to the process is really important. If you want to get in on the sexiness of voting, you can still register right through Election Day in November, online, over the phone, or via text. 
Now, some of those voters registered by New Era are likely to end up in Jill Stein's camp. Despite the dissatisfaction with the major party candidates, Stein, the Green Party, barely making a dent in the polls, single digits. During campaign swing through Colorado yesterday, we asked Stein how she would help support the thousands of Coloradans that she would displace from traditional energy jobs. I'll know what your stance is and transitioning to clean energy jobs by 2030. What do you say to the thousands of people who are employed by fracking in this state? What's your strategy to help them if you come in as president and get rid of it? They must be assured that they will not go without a job and without benefits. Dr. Stein has an open invitation to join us here for some questions on next. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is having trouble paying its bills these days. It's already had to eliminate more than 50 jobs and $40 million out of its budget. Parks and Wildlife is now talking about closing access to some public lands, sh shutting down hatcheries and limiting hunting licenses. It wants to now double the cost of in-state hunting and fishing licenses. Those fees have not increased since 2005. But you can imagine that's not going over well in the public meetings that they're holding around the state. Um, understandably, we have some folks who have said to us, you know, my wife, you know, we go see a, a play at the Buell Theater, it costs me $200. So, yeah, double your fees, whatever you need to do, go ahead and do it, you guys. And we have some folks that are, you know, uh, some long-term hunters that their whole families hunt, and they said, you know, this is really going to put a crimp in our fall recreation and how we feed our family, and we don't appreciate anyone suggesting that you should double fees. And the fee increase would have to be approved by the state legislature, which means Parks and Wildlife has another sell job to do after talking with the public. Just because most everyone can agree that Denver and Boulder have an issue with homelessness does not mean that there's agreement about all proposed solutions. Our Dan Grossman looks at one method being discussed and debated in Boulder. Don't you think cold in a winter time? There's always going to be people who judge and never really know who they're talking to. This can be isolating. Funny how that feeling goes away. It's kind of scary. Live by the seat of your pants a little bit. For Laura Terrell and boyfriend Jeff Smith, I by that, uh, the it's equally disorienting. I stayed in a shed. Now imagine this life at 18. Housing is a right. You know, they deserve to be housed. And you can imagine why Claire Clerman is so keen on helping. The relationships, the support, the services that they need comes once they have housing. Claire is talking about housing first. The idea that once there is a home, there is a basis for stability. It's about providing people with what they need most. Her nonprofit Attention Homes wants to build a 40-unit homeless housing community on this parking lot near Pearl Street. No sobriety or job needed. We'll be attracting even more than we already have now at this point. Neighbor Bonnie Gossman isn't too happy about it. We know that there's homeless activity here, but to ask for more in this immediate area is problematic. Among the issues she says will come, including homeless growth, safety and assimilation of the top two. Some of the neighbors have experienced uh, finding syringes in their, in their alleyways. But ask those who've been there, and they'll tell you it's a safety line they rarely see. They need more protection. They need to know that people care about them. They need to know that there's people in the world that haven't given up on them. To believe in this living. For a life that's often isolated. We're just very concerned. Help never looked so divided. Does everybody love everybody, you know? It's just a hard way to go. For next, this is Dan Grossman. The proposed non-sober homeless center could open in Boulder this time in 2019. I'm curious what you think, especially you, if you or somebody that you know has had experience with these issues. We'd like to hear that perspective. You can email us next at 9news.com or you can always get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. Next, without question, the single most important story we've aired on this program. A cross-country search for an answer to a single question. My name's Chris Vanderveen. I'm a reporter of the NBC affiliate out of Colorado. What will it take for the government to act on a known safety problem that keeps killing people? Especially considering the FAA's manager of aviation tells us he won't personally fly in these things anymore. That's next.
today's storm has brought really a taste of fall here in some parts of the metro area. Sweater weather, if you will, up in the high country. We've been watching snowfall. Yes, and a lot of it. Take a look at our web camera out there at Pikes Peak. We have been watching the snowfall coming down early this morning through this afternoon. About eight inches stacking up out there at the summit. It's all because of the storm system that's sitting in south central Colorado across the San Luis Valley. It's whipping up all of this moisture into parts of the metro area coming in from the northeast to the southwest. An aerial flood advisory is in place for parts of Weld County until about eight o'clock. Some heavy downpours out there and the big story has been the hail tough to plow through it all in Colorado Springs. Their flash flood warning ends around 745 and those showers are beginning to wind down too. This storm is a slow mover. It's just going to be tracking across parts of southeastern Colorado, so we are keeping the rain on repeat for your Tuesday afternoon. I think the storms push out later this evening by about 10 11 o'clock. We'll go with mostly cloudy skies and tomorrow morning you might actually find a little bit of fog out there at the bus stop by the afternoon. The showers return. We stay in the low 80s Tuesday and Wednesday, but finally a bit of a warm up as we head toward that holiday weekend. Kyle. America's civilian helicopter fleet has a problem with fires. If you've paid attention to our lengthy nine wants to know investigation, you know that. But when Chris Vanderveen sought answers from the Federal Aviation Administration, he was routinely told no on camera interview about this. Chris decided that the issue is too important to be brushed off with written statements. They were pilots, paramedics, flight nurses. No one here, each of them precious, needs another reminder of what's at stake. Ronald Scott Rector, Missouri. At the annual air medical memorial ceremony, the cost of the status quo remains all too clear. He was our, our hope for the future. He uh, was just 51. He was a father. Beverly Rector lost her son last year. Surveillance video shows the fireball that erupted after impact. A federal investigation concluded the fire and not the crash killed him. So once that fuel is ignited, no one has a chance. We've already shown you other post-crash fires. Fires that only happened because of antiquated fuel systems that were never designed to survive an otherwise survivable crash. It's a damn shame. What is it going to take? Well, it may take an act of Congress. After our investigation, Congress wanted answers, and so did we. Yet for months, the Federal Aviation Administration denied our interview requests. So recently, we traveled to the one place we knew what a beautiful shot that was. people with the FAA would undoubtedly be a massive and annual air show in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. My name is Chris Vanderveen. I'm a reporter of the NBC affiliate out of Colorado. That's Jim Viola, the FAA's manager of general aviation. We'll get back to him in a moment, but first, but the helicopter just crashed. more on a problem the FAA has sidestepped for decades. I don't know if you know the line. There's a nice fire going. Studies, many dating back to the 70s and early 80s, have repeatedly warned the FAA of the problem. Finally, in 1994, the FAA decided to act, but in doing so also created a massive loophole. And that allowed manufacturers to build thousands of new helicopters with the same old problem. Vulnerable fuel systems. The helicopter crashed. Systems like the one that yeah. ruptured on a flight for life last year in Frisco burning Dave Repture on more than 90% of his body. In 1980, the NTSB... We uh, were thinking of the flight nurse when we finally tracked down the head of the FAA at a Q&A session for pilots at that Wisconsin air show. And there's an individual by the name of Dave Repture. It would become our first and to date only chance to talk to Michael Werda. My question is this, how much more studying, how much more time does the FAA need to address this issue? This is something that um, we're actually very focused on now. I don't have a specific answer in terms of the when, but um, Peggy, I don't know if there's something that you would want to add. Peggy never did get up. It's something that we have a lot of smart people looking at. One of those smart people. You're a helicopter pilot yourself, right? I am. Jim Viola, the FAA manager we told you about earlier. How much more time do you need before you say enough is enough? Well, and that is the hard, hard question to ask. Maybe that's because he told us he decided a few years ago the only helicopters he would fly would be helicopters with the latest crash-resistant fuel systems on board. I was at the point where I wasn't going to fly 
and a helicopter that didn't have the upgrade. And that means a main safety manager for the FAA would refuse to fly close to 5,000 helicopters in use today. And I don't want to look like a fool when I catch a skid and roll the helicopter and it catches fire. Yet to date, the FAA sees no problem if others, many of them unsuspecting, decide to fly in one. People like Dave Repture, who spent more than a year in the hospital. What do you say to him? That's, uh, that's where I said that change could happen. I mean, right now, industry can stop producing aircraft that don't have crash-worthy things. Industry. The same industry that has waited four decades for guidance from the FAA. No wonder Rector is concerned about more fires. Good people have to get off their rear end and do something. And more reminders for a group of people in need of no more. We have to speak up, otherwise we're not going to make any progress. For next, Chris Vanderveen, 9 News. Chris says there's currently a working group studying this problem for the FAA, and that team expects to have a report out by the end of the year. If statistics are our guide, we are likely to see at least one or two other helicopter crashes and deadly fires by that time. If you haven't seen this, you had a busy weekend. If you have seen it, you know you want to watch it again. And after telling you about the city of Denver suing a guy over his dangerous steps, we heard about a different city with a different approach, fixing them. Hey, may I make a recommendation? This is where we point you towards something, anything that is not ours, but is awesome. Okay, we lied, this is ours, but it's really awesome. It's too stinking good not to see again. They can't stop playing this on ESPN. It's all over the interwebs. Junior at Columbine High School, Dylan pritchett Etner flips over the goalie and scores, except he didn't golden count. Ref said he was offside. It is no less awesome, Dylan. You own this for the rest of your life, baby, because none of the rest of us have ever pulled off one of those. Last week, we were telling you about the city of Denver suing a homeowner after an employee got hurt on his rickety steps. Well, here is a similar story, but with a different ending. Berthed firefighters were responding to a call when they ran across this set of very unsafe steps. So they offered to come back by the house while the owner was in the hospital and build him a new set of stairs. The homeowner was super thankful, as we all should be. Special thank you tonight to Berthed Fire, specifically Lieutenant Forbes, Engineer Cole, and firefighter Peacock. The 16th Street Mall is looking at some issues these days. We've talked about them, violence, drugs. But if you go down there, you'll be looking at something shiny and new. Battery-powered mall ride shuttles. Shuttles that our politics guy, Brandon Ritterman, couldn't help but notice bear a real resemblance to the Southwest Airlines paint scheme. Red and blue with yellow accents. You will not be receiving a free bag of pet pretzels, but you can bring a bag on board. All right, we've been doing most of the talking here. It'll be your turn when we return. Quick pro tip, don't eat anything growing in Denver's public parks. Might seem obvious, but someone tweeted at Denver Parks and Rec this morning asking for a list of edible plants in Denver's parks. Tweet says, feel like I saw cherries in many apples in City Park. Denver Parks and Rec tweeted back with a simple answer. We don't recommend that anyone eat anything growing at a public park. All right, very good. Hey, there is a raging debate online tonight about whether Next is terrible because it's nothing like the news or whether Next is terrible because it's exactly like the news. Jake Marsing tweets, this is like the regular news, only Kyle doesn't have a tie on. William Wood says, this show is terrible. You lost a viewer until you reestablish something that resembles the news. I don't know how we reconcile those two. Maybe we'll go with Rick Foster, who just says, thanks for bringing the show to air. Thank you, Rick. See you next time.